may be seated. And as you are, you'll be helped if you take a copy of God's Word and turn with me to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians. And you, if you use one of the black hardback Bibles in the seat in front of you, you'll find that on page 983. We started just a couple of weeks ago in the book of Colossians with an overview. And the banner that we want to hang over this small but significant letter of the Apostle is all of Christ and all of life. And it's a great charge to us who follow and trust the Lord Jesus Christ that His Lordship is all-encompassing without boundary or limit or application to our lives. And we'll now begin this week in earnest, looking and walking through this, past, this book uh, sequentially, Lord willing. And we'll begin this morning by looking at verses 1 to 14 of chapter 1, what essentially is Paul's opening prayer for the Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. It is written, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we ought always to thank you if we are found in your Son, Jesus, with love for your church and hope secured before you in heaven. We ought always to be grateful and to be seeking you to grow more and more in knowing you obeying you, and being strengthened to patiently trust your word that our lives would be holy and fully pleasing to you. Our Father, you know the condition of our hearts as we hear and come to your word this morning that so many other aims, so many other goals crowd out the desires of our heart and our life. And Father, we pray that through your word, you would again strengthen and straighten our focus upon your Son. And we pray that grumbling would be cast off for gratitude for your grace. And Father, we pray that confusion and we pray that aiming at the things of this world would be set apart before aiming for growth in you in Christ, that you would be glorified above all and in all that we do. We ask for your help, Father, to hear your word as you intend with faith and the desire to repent and obey. And we pray for the one who expounds it, be his help and strength, that he would make clear what you have put in it. We ask this, Father, leaning and expecting the help of your Spirit, in Christ's name, amen. What do you pray for when you pray? Now, we can have, even in a mixed gathering or even in a broader gathering than, than this, ask when we pray, because nearly everyone prays. Even a recent survey picked up the fact that 30% of professed atheists pray. 
Now, what does an atheist pray for? I don't know exactly. It's probably not to know God, but it is probably to get relief from some crisis or trial or to be rescued from some calamity. And the thing is, when Christians pray, what they pray for is often not very dissimilar to a prayer we might expect of an atheist. We pray about what's important to us in any particular situation or circumstance. We might pray for a better job or for just having a job. We might pray for relief from some trial or from some health condition or weakness. We might pray for God to give us a spouse, or we might pray for God to fix the spouse He's given us. But whatever it is we pray for, it's often on the level of these things, the situations and circumstances of our life. That's what makes the Apostle Paul's opening prayer here in his letter to the Colossians so reorienting. Because notice in verse 3, he says, when we pray, what he prays for are not the things that are at the top usually of our prayer lists. And it's even more radical when we remember that 2,000 years ago for our fellow brothers and sisters in this church, there was plenty to be concerned about. The city of Colossae has been called more than once as the least important place that the Apostle Paul ever wrote a letter to. It was in what we call now Turkey, Western Turkey. It was about 100 miles inland from the city of Ephesus that you may recall from Paul's long ministry there. And he also wrote a letter that's very similar to this one to the Ephesians. Now, centuries passed before this letter, Colossae had been a thriving center and city. It was famous for Colossian wool. And it was right along a major trade route, but that route had since been moved in the expansion of the Roman Empire, and with the moving of the trade route, the economy in Colossae collapsed and was declining. You might think of Colossae as you might think of the Rust Belt in the United States in our day, sort of like a Cleveland or a Detroit. It was important in the past, but nobody thinks about Cleveland and Detroit as being the center of the American future of growth. In fact, Paul himself had never even been to Colossae. He tells us in verse 4 that he'd only heard of their faith. You see, the Apostle Paul had spent about three years in the city of Ephesus, as we said, just 100 miles to the east. And we were told in the book of Acts that while Paul was in Ephesus, the word of the Lord went throughout the whole region of Asia, or what we call Turkey. It's likely then that Epaphras, whom he mentions in verse 7, who was a Colossian, was converted. He was probably in Ephesus for trade or some matter, and he came under the hearing of the gospel. And Epaphras was likely trained by Paul in the school that Paul established there and then was sent to Colossae as Paul's beloved fellow servant, what he calls him in verse 7, to be a faithful minister of Christ to his hometown. So Epaphras had gone and had evangelized and brought the gospel to his hometown, but now he's back with Paul seeking Paul's help in Rome where Paul's imprisoned. Paul's been imprisoned in Rome, but Epaphras is seeking him for help for the church in Colossae. And so Paul then writes this letter, this letter to one of the least important places he's ever written. And the first thing that Paul wants these people to know, people he's never seen, but who'd certainly heard of him, he wants them to know how he's been praying for them. And how he's been praying has nothing to do with what we might think first are the problems in Colossae. Colossians faced a declining economy. They faced deadly illnesses. They couldn't even imagine the health care we have today. They faced Roman oppression, serious persecution. But the Apostle Paul mentions none of these things when he lays out how he's been praying for them. Think about that. He mentions none of the things when he prays for them. What tends to predominate our prayers, what we regularly ask of God, doesn't even make the apostles' list. But look at how Paul does pray. Notice he doesn't even begin with requests. In verse 3, he begins by saying, we always thank God for the hope you have received in the gospel of Christ that you know the truth, you know the gospel. And then when he does begin to give requests, beginning in verse 9 
he prays that what? That they would grow to know that gospel, that they would know God's truth, that their lives, verse 10, would be wholly pleasing to him, and that they would be always conscious, verses 13 and 14, you've been delivered to a new kingdom. How you live before your king now is everything. Paul's foremost concern in his prayer was not for God to make their circumstances more favorable, but that he would make their lives more faithful. Paul's predominant request is not for what we might think would be just normal, intuitive life goals. He prays instead, wherever they are, that their lives would be godly and that they would know the God who's delivered them and rescued him, that they would be, verse 10, fully pleasing to the Lord. Now, Paul's relatively brief prayer here resolves many of the questions that Christians often ask when it comes to prayer. Questions like, if God is sovereign, why do we pray? Or how are we to deal with unanswered prayer? when God doesn't respond as we've asked. But what questions like that mainly reveal is how we think about prayer at all. That we too often think about prayer as some kind of shopping list that we bring to the mall of God's power to ask Him to give us from the various stores He might have. That's why we ask, if God's already decided decided to give me what He's going to give me, why do I pray at all? Or what do I do when I come to the mall of God's power and he refuses to open and give me what I ask? But what we see in the Bible as we do right here in the Apostles' Prayer is prayer isn't typically presented that way, how we can often think about it. That in the Bible, in God's design and giving us prayer, prayer is way more about sharing, relating, and communing with God than simply getting stuff from Him. It's way more about knowing and enjoying the God who's brought us to Him in His Son. Notice that in verse 3 where Paul begins and what he says he always does. Notice we pray just to give thanks in what God has done. Paul says, I just enjoy that you have faith and love and hope and God did it. And I just spend time thanking him and enjoying that our God is a God of mercies. And I give him great gratitude for his grace in the whole world and especially to you. And then in verse 9, when Paul does begin to bring requests, when he begins to ask, it's simply for the grace just to do that more. I want to know him more. I want to enjoy him more. I want you to know and please him in all you do. And if you remember just two weeks ago when we surveyed the whole book of Colossians, if you remember the sorts of things that come up later, look at verses 10 through 12. Just scan your eyes over it and notice how these are the very things that Paul is praying for them for. He prays that they're worthy of the Lord, that they increase in knowledge, that they live in gratitude. And these are the very things that Paul's going to spend the rest of the letter commanding them to do. He's praying that God gives them the grace to do what God will, through him, command them to do. That's why the famous prayer from the 4th century brother and leader Augustine, command what you will, will what you command, is totally biblical. Command whatever you will, God, and give me the grace to do it. Empower me, strengthen me, give me grace to grow in you, to do what you've declared. Our struggle in prayer often is because we miss the point of prayer entirely. It's more about growing in God before it's getting from God. It's far more about knowing and fellowshipping with the God who would come to us in Jesus Christ and to enjoy the relationship that he has established upon the death and resurrection of his son. And what we have here in Colossians 1 is a, is a great pattern, pattern for prayer. In fact, the next time you pray for someone, why not just pray this? You can especially use this as Paul did when you pray for churches that you don't know and not met with. 
or if you're praying for other church members that you don't have a more intimate friendship with, this is a great prayer to pray. You can pray this for me anytime you want because I always need to walk more worthy of the Lord and be pleasing to him and be strengthened by his power. We all do. This is a great pattern for prayer. But more than that, if this is what the apostle is praying for the Colossians, then it's not just a pattern for prayer, it's a pattern of life. It's a direction of how to live. And like Paul's prayer, what he's beginning to teach, even as he writes down, this is what I'm praying, and this is what I'll be telling you to do, I'm praying that this is how you live. That your life is not so much about what you get or about the circumstances you find yourself in or, or getting them more favorable, but your life is far more about who you live before, the God who has called you by grace, and who you become in Him, your character growing in His grace. By God's grace, God has brought Christians to Himself, and knowing his immeasurable grace in Christ, they want to know and grow more and more in him. And so what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, his church here in, in Colossians 1, is that our life goal, the main aim of our lives, is to grow in the grace of the God who has loved us in Jesus Christ. Our main calling, our main purpose, if we use that word, is to grow in knowing and pleasing our God who has shed his grace upon us in Christ. And that's really just the two points and observations we want to pull out of this passage this morning. And we will split the text looking at verses 3 through 8 and then verses 9 through 14. And in verses 3 through 8, we can consider knowing the God of grace. Knowing the God of grace and then in verses 9 through 14, we want to look at growing in the grace of God. Knowing our God and growing in His grace. Well, let's look first at the beginning of Paul's prayer in verses 3 to 8, knowing the God of grace. And Paul's gratitude here, his prayer, reveals three important truths about God and how He works in grace. Three truths. The first to note is that Paul does not pray to a nameless, anonymous, generic spiritual being. He doesn't thank the power of the universe. Notice verse 3, we always thank God, who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if he prays to God the Father, that must mean the Lord Jesus Christ is God the Son, the Son of the Father. And he prays to the Father of the Lord Jesus, meaning the Lord Jesus is God the Son, the one in whom, verse 4, the Colossians trust. And notice how he rounds it out in verse 8, the love they have for all the saints is love that the Spirit has produced. He prays to God the Father for what he's done in his Son as his Spirit is now working in them. God, the only God there is, the God of grace, is indivisibly one being who eternally exists in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And the reason that Christians have confessed that since the beginning of the church is because we can't escape it. It's right here in Paul's prayer. God thanks the triune God for what each person of God has done. And the grace of God is really what reveals God's triunity because it is the triunity of God that explains how His grace has come as the Father in His delivering power sent His Son to be our Savior, to bring us back to Him, and then to send His Spirit to give us life and faith and love to walk before Him in holiness and in truth. The gospel of Jesus Christ reveals God as triune. As God the Father made us in His image, but we rebelled against Him in sin, but He sent His Son to bear our judgment and to rescue us from receiving the judgment that we all deserve for our sin. All who have trust in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, are saved and rescued out from under God's judgment. And the Spirit brings them life and faith and empowerment to live trusting in the Son and growing in knowledge of Him, loving God and loving all who belong to Him. The good news of the gospel 
is that God saves us from himself. He saves us from himself by suffering his own judgment to bring us into himself by his Spirit. And all of that is totally possible because God is triune. And even as Paul is praying to the God of grace, he's knowing the God who is triune. But secondly, he notices not only God as triune, but God's grace creates three virtues. In verses three through the beginning of verse five, there's three important virtues that come up several places in the New Testament, but here so significantly. They're sometimes called in Christian theology the divine sisters, the three virtues, faith, hope, and love. And by keeping all three together, as Paul thanks God for their, verse 4, faith in Christ, their love for the saints, and the hope laid up in heaven. By keeping these three together, we have a really good grasp on what true Christianity looks like. What does it mean to be a real Christian? How do we know the difference between one who is a Christian and one who is professing some allegiance to Christianity, but it's not sincere, it's not spiritual, it's not real? There's a lot of confusion about that in our day. It's been that for a long time. And a lot of this confusion owes sometimes to our, you might even say, overemphasis or exclusive emphasis on faith or we might say belief. So sometimes we might summarize Christianity as just believing. Do you believe? And while that's certainly true, and the Bible teaches that here when we have faith, hope, and love together, or belief, hope, and love together, we see what real faith looks like and what it produces in one's life by the work of the Spirit. What God does in grace, what He does through the work of His Spirit, is creates a life of trust and faith, a life of faith that works itself out in love, and a life of faith and love that are built upon hope. You see, faith without love and hope would just be an idea. It's just a philosophy. It's just something to subscribe to, and and really the scripture says it's not that different from what the demons already believe because they know there is a God and they claim to know he exists too. Or if we were just to have love and we were to remove faith and hope, well, then Christianity is just empty sentiment. It's just love for love's sake. And that love ultimately fails because it has no boundaries, it has no shape, it has no foundation. And if we were just to have hope and to remove love and faith, then we just have mere presumption. We just have the assumption that everything works out, everyone gets to a better place somehow, it can't be that bad. But no, when God creates new life, when the Spirit is at work by His grace, He births all three in someone's life, faith, love, and hope. But even more importantly to notice, notice the relationship between verse 4 and 5, that is the relationship between faith and love and hope. Because Paul here explains how they work together in God's grace. How does God's grace operate to give new life. Notice verse 5, because of. That's so significant. Faith in Christ Jesus, love for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. It is because of the hope they have that faith in Christ and love for other Christians was born. Do you see where Paul's driving? What's the bomb that goes off when you believe the gospel? What is the massive shift in orientation when you hear the word of truth and you sincerely grasp it and trust in it? Or another way to ask that is, what is the ultimate good of the good news? What makes the good news firmly, fully, and eternally good? It's that we have hope. In a world marked by hopelessness, there's hope. And it's not just any hope, verse 5. Notice, it's the hope laid up for you in heaven. Literally, the hope stored away, locked away in heaven, secured before God. Isn't that why you trust the Lord Jesus Christ? Because he brings 
hope and has accomplished hope? Isn't that why we love all those who love him? Because we're hoping in that together, to be even with him together. Now, if you're here this morning, friend, and you are not a Christian, please listen to the word of God. There is hope. There is always hope. Regardless of your situation, regardless of your station in life and the circumstances of it, there is hope. And not hope that evaporates or hope that goes away or hope that has an expiration date on it. Hope stored up in heaven, locked away, and nothing is secure as the throne room of God. And that hope is the hope of being with him forever, trusting him by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died for sinners in judgment and rose again to give us his righteousness. All who trust in him have the hope, the certain confidence that they will be with him forever. And however else the rest of our lives shake out in this world, whether it's great comfort and success or whether it's calamity and tragedy, that hope doesn't change a bit. And so it's the hope that is the foundation of our lives. We have hope stored up in heaven if we trust the Lord Jesus Christ. If you trust him, you may have hope. And especially if you're here this morning and you are struggling with hopelessness, listen, there is hope. There is hope for you if you would trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the word of God. There is hope. And Christian, beloved, that is just important for you and I as it is for those who are outside of Christ. We need to remember God has given us hope. And our hope in Him is what sustains our faith and our love for His people. Notice, just glance over to verse 23. Our hope is our foundation in life. It's how we live, especially when life is hard. Our faith in Christ is founded on our hope to be with Him and to be like Him forever. The reason we trust Him, the reason we hold on to His Word and His ways, even when it's hard, is because, well, it's just what Peter said. Where else are we to go? You have the words of eternal life. You have hope. So I hold on to you, and I trust you even when it's hard. Even our love for all the saints, our love for fellow Christians, it's founded on the hope that we'll all be together forever. And so we might as well love one another now, because we're not going to float on separate clouds with our own harps. We're going to live together in a city, in the New Jerusalem, And so we work to love one another because of that hope. One day, our faith will become sight. One day, our hope will become possession. And in that day, only love will last forever. Perfect love for God and for all his people. But until then, we grasp and hold on to hope as our anchor, as our foundation, what supports our trust and our love. And that's really important, beloved, when we sense our faith and love are weak, when we sense our trusting in Christ and our compassion for other Christians is is wobbling, what we're looking at is symptoms of hopelessness. We're looking at symptoms of letting go of hope. In those moments, we're living like now is most important and as though God has not promised us a great tomorrow. But we have a great tomorrow secured in heaven, and so we can trust him, and we can love others as we hold on to his promised hope. The Christian life is unexplainable, has no accounting apart from this hope. Nothing else will sustain faith and love like the hope that God has promised us to be with him forever in Christ Jesus. And Paul notices then, thirdly, Not just grace from the triune God, grace to create the virtues of faith, love, and hope, but grace that comes through means. Notice the shift that Paul makes in verse 6. He begins talking about how God's grace was brought, the means by which it came. And notice what Paul describes in verses 7 and 8 with the work of Epaphras. It's all the work of God. Do you see that in verse 6? 
it's come to you, as indeed the whole world, the gospel, is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you. And, and Paul the Apostle describes the gospel like some tree or some garden that God himself is cultivating. He's bringing growth throughout the world. But then Paul talks about how he's done it. Well, he's done it, verse 7, through Epaphras. And maybe some Colossians said, hey, hey, I know Epaphras. He's the one who shared the gospel with me. Or, or, or I, I came to hear him preach, and that's how, that's how I got saved. I know Epaphras. We're told later in chapter 4, he was one of you. That's why we know he's a Colossian. He had come from among them. And by his ministry, look what Paul says in verse 6. That's how they heard the gospel. That's how they come to understand the grace of God and truth. Verse 7, just as you learned it from Epaphras. Now that word learned in verse 7 is a verbal form of a word that many of us would be familiar with, disciple. So you might even want to paraphrase this or think about this, just as you have been despite, discipled by Epaphras. So Paul is talking about Epaphras didn't blow through town with four spiritual laws in a poem. He came and gave systematic teaching and instruction in God's Word. He taught them what Christ commanded. Now what happened is probably Epaphras is just repeating what he learned from the Apostle Paul. He had been in Ephesus most likely. And we know that Paul even rented a, a hall. It's described for us in Acts 19. And he taught daily for a couple of years. He taught systematically and trained people in God's Word. Epaphras was likely there for that stretch of time enough to know how to disciple his own hometown. And so Epaphras came to his hometown, brought the gospel, and undoubtedly labored hard. A faithful minister of Christ, being spent for his beloved hometown, preaching and teaching the gospel. Epaphras really worked to bring the gospel and to disciple Colossians, to help them grow in Christ and to faithfully serve them. But yet Paul began this section in verse 3, thanking God. So which is it? Who worked? How did the Colossians come in grace? Was it God or was it the labors of Epaphras? Yes, absolutely. God worked through Epaphras' work. We can often tend to relegate God's work to just what we don't understand or just the things that we know we obviously don't control. In fact, one Christian writer calls this the God in the gaps view. God just fills the gaps. I do all the rest. I do my work and then God steps in to fill the things that I can't do. But the danger with that mentality is it leaves me totally passive just waiting for God to do something. It sort of portrays Christian life and ministry like a volleyball game, probably like the volleyball game some will play tomorrow, where you just set and you just wait. Okay, God, spike. Where are you, God? Spike it. But the Christian life isn't a volleyball game where we just do our part setting, but then God spikes. No, the Christian life is much more like tandem skydiving, where you're harnessed to an instructor, and he supports and enables every part of the jump, everything from the jump, the fall, to the landing. And it's going all out and trusting that that instructor stays harnessed to you, or it's going to go really, really bad. And he's there every step of the way, giving enablement and effectiveness to everything you do. That's what Christian ministry is like, tandem skydiving jumping out of a perfectly good pain, trusting your instructor, the Lord Jesus, to give the grace in all that you do. God works through the work of men. God brings real grace through the labors of men and women who trust Him, who rely on Him, and He brings fruit from it. All that Epaphras did in discipling and evangelizing the Colossians was God's work was God's cultivating of the gospel. His kingdom is a kingdom of means. God works through ways, through instruments. Primarily, his instrument is people. God works through people who spread his word and who teach his word and who work really hard by his grace so that God would bear fruit through their work, which is his work, 
because he works through his people. This is why a church like ours, a church that so values the sovereignty of God and all the doctrines of his sovereign grace that we see in God's word and have been recovered in the Reformation, that's why a church like ours must also emphasize disciplines and actions and, and activities like Bible reading and evangelism and reading a Bible with your neighbor, or starting a, a Bible study in your work, because that's how God's grace works. It's not a volleyball game where I just pray for my workplace and I stand back and go, okay, God, spike it. No, it's like tandem skydiving, where I jump out in my workplace trusting the grace of God, and I invite coworkers and friends to a Bible study or to, to talk about things over lunch or to meet with my neighbors and share the gospel with them because God's grace works through the work of men. That's how the grace of God comes. That's why we in our church focus on training others to speak and preach the gospel, to study God's word, to counsel and share with others. We don't do any of these things because we don't believe in God's grace or we somehow believe God's grace is not enough but because we're absolutely persuaded by the word of God, like passages here, that that's how God's grace works. God sends his grace through his word, his word brought by his people. And so we work trusting our instructor who has harnessed to us every step of the way. We work that he would bring fruit from his grace. So Paul here calls three important truths to know the God of grace. Looking secondly at verse 9, growing in the grace of God. Our calling in life, secondly, is to grow in the grace of God. After describing how God worked in Epaphras, Paul basically prays, beginning in verse 9, that God would just continue doing the same things he's already done, that they would be filled with knowing God's will. Notice that in verse 9, his first request, that you'd be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, when we hear that phrase, his will, or God's will, what do we usually think of first? We typically think of decision-making. We think of all our options and how we're going to sort through them and needing God's help for that. But even that response, it, it, there's nothing inherently wrong with it, but it indicates our context. We live in the first world, the majority world. We live in the 21st century. We live in a context of relative prosperity where we're used to having options. And so when we think of God, about God's will, the first thing we think of is God help me find the right option. Help me find the right decision that's in line with your will. But in most of human history and around the world, you had very few options. You didn't think about what you were gonna do as a career. You just did what your father did. That's what you did and you married one of the boys in the village, ladies, there were no other options. So you knew, even in kindergarten, I'm marrying one of these guys. In fact, in many parts of the world, that decision was probably made for you before you were even conscious of the institution of marriage. And even in days like the Colossians, although there would have been some difference, for most of human history, most people lived in a 15 to 20 mile radius. Their entire lives never went beyond that. So to know the will of God, as we see it in Scripture, it wasn't the anxiety of knowing who to marry with an internet of options. It wasn't what school to go to or what career path to take. It was, as Paul says at the end of verse 9, how to have spiritual wisdom and understanding. How to walk. To have spiritual wisdom means to know what's spiritually important how to be wise about what's spiritually important, or what we might call today having discernment. How to discern what is consistent with God and his grace and his truth and what is not. Essentially, Paul's praying that you would so know the truth of God that you've received. You would so know his word and the gospel that you would have discernment and then you would therefore, look at verse 10, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. You would have such spiritual wisdom, you would have such spiritual discernment that the direction of your life would be fully pleasing to him. That you would please God in your life. 
Paul's prayer is that you would grow in so learning his truth, grow in so knowing the gospel and its implications that your life would please the God who brought you to himself in Christ, that you would so know how to please him with your lives. And there's at least two foundational truths that we're to grasp here then about growing in grace. At least two, there's many more. But the first is that we learn doctrine to live. We learn doctrine to live. Notice the definite order in verses 9 and 10. Paul prays they're filled with knowing God's will, that they have spiritual discernment, so that, verse 10, their lives would be worthy and pleasing to him. Paul prays they would grow in knowing God's truth, that their lives would be fully pleasing to God. So be filled with his word that your life would be faithful to him in all you do. My favorite opening line in any book is Charles Hodges' way of life. And he opens the book like this. It's the clearest principle of divine revelation that holiness is the fruit of truth. The holiness of life, how you live, it's the fruit and consequence of truth. Truth is what directs your steps. Truth is what directs your life. And that's what Paul's praying. I pray so you're so filled with the knowledge of truth, you're so spiritually discerning because you know his word that your lives are inevitably faithful to him. You're pleasing to him in all you do. Why do we focus so much on getting doctrine right? It's so the direction of our lives are true and right. Do not ever fear going deep into doctrine, going deep into God's word, if it's to direct your life. Just be afraid of knowing doctrine for the wrong reasons. Be afraid of knowledge if knowledge will be to you just a statue, something you carve and polish and put on your shelf to show off visitors when they show up. Do you know what I know? Let me tell you. Be afraid of that. But don't be afraid of knowing doctrine if doctrine is to you a two-by-four that you're building a house to live in with. That's why God gives us his word. It's the lumber of our lives. His doctrines are the truths that we walk by, that we're to be faithful to him in. We learn doctrine to live. The second truth we see here, just in the first main emphasis of Paul's prayers, is we make decisions for God's glory. We make decisions for God's glory. To have spiritual discernment, spiritual wisdom and understanding, to be discerning because of the word of God means we make good decisions. But notice, though, the goal of my decisions will be forever shaped by knowing him and his word. It's about, verse 10, how I might be fully pleasing to God how I might bear fruit in every good work, how I might grow to know him. When I face the multitude of options that we have in our first century majority modern world, when I face that seemingly innumerable options, my question is not, how do I get the most easy, comfortable, safe life? My question is, what would bring most glory to God? How can I most please him? What are the potentials for pleasing God with this decision? What are the potentials of pleasing God with that decision? It's how I most be pleasing to him. What will bring most glory to God? And I hope, beloved, that that lands on you as a burden-relieving truth. That we don't have to bow down at the cult of options in our culture living lives of paranoia and anxiety that we'll somehow miss the perfect option if we don't make triangulate the right choices. For starters, the perfect options were lost when our, when our Adam and Eve fell in the garden. But secondly, in a very real and ultimate way, it doesn't matter where I work. It doesn't matter what kind of house I live in. It doesn't matter what I achieve and who recognizes it and who doesn't. In an ultimate sense, none of those things matter. What matters is how I live in my work for God's glory. How do I use the possessions and the resources he gives me for his glory? Is it fully pleasing to him? Have I done it in a manner worthy of the Lord? 
You can be an elected official at the big building six blocks from here and not bring any glory to God. And you can wash the toilets in that building and be the most notable, God-glorifying, God-pleasing person in this town. What we ultimately do in those options is of relatively small importance. What matters most with our options is are we living for the glory of God? That is the watershed that changes everything about how I make decisions. What will be pleasing to him? And of course, that then raises the question of what does it mean to be pleasing to the Lord? And Paul outlines it in four brief ways here, in verses 10 through 12. Four brief ways. He describes it first in verse 10 as your deeds, bearing fruit in every good work, to live distinctly and purposely to obey God and to, to work before Him, to live each part of life conscious of His Lordship and His call on our lives, to do what's good because what he's, that's what he's called us to do, to bear fruit in that way. First deed, secondly, verse 10, to live in devotion, increasing in the knowledge of God. And notice the relationship between bearing fruit and good works and increasing in the knowledge of God. As you live a life of obedience and faith, as you seek to do good works, what do you need to do? You need to risk. You need to give. You need to sacrifice. You need to deny yourself. And what do you do as you do that? As God meets you in his grace, you increase in knowing him more and more. As you step out in faith and obedience, say, God, I'm going to trust you in this. What happens? Your knowledge of God increase. Beloved, there is, there is wisdom and knowledge of God that is awaiting your obedience, that is awaiting you to trust him in and to experience how he meets you as you walk by faith how he meets and satisfies us in lives of sacrifice and self-denial. So as you bear works, bearing fruit in every good work, the knowledge of God and your communion with him and your devotion to him only increases. Thirdly, verse 11, Paul shows, says that they'll, they'll be pleasing to him as they grow in diligence. Notice verse 11, strengthen for all endurance and patience. And what is characteristic of Christians is endurance, is patience, patiently awaiting our hope. And it's very normal in the New Testament, it's very normal to associate God's power with our patience. It comes up all the time. In the parable of the sower, Jesus explains that the good soil, the soil that receives his word, is the one that bears fruit with patience, holding fast to his word. When Paul is in Corinth, and in 2 Corinthians, he's separating himself from the false apostles, he points to his, in 2 Corinthians 6, 4, his great patience, his great endurance. That's what proves God's power in him. When you're a younger Christian, you likely pray for God's power to do something unique and explosive, to change the world, change a church, change a ministry, because you underestimate the battle within yourself. But when you're an older Christian, you're likely praying for the power of God to fight off the world that's trying to change you because you're very acquainted with the battle within. And you're just praying you endure to the end, that you patiently trust God, that you hold fast to his word awaiting your hope. And that's what Paul says, I'm praying for you that you're strengthened with God's power to endure and to be patient. And then fourthly, Paul prays they grow in doxology. And I just needed another D. It's gratitude for God. Lives of gratitude. Or doxology keeps the points lined up, you know. Deeds, devotion, diligence, doxology. Or lives of gratitude. And what's important to note, end of verse 11, that the, the phrase with joy belongs with giving thanks in verse 12. So we ought to read that as with joy giving thanks. Joyful gratitude. Rejoicing in gratitude because you have such a hope. You have, as he says in verse 12, an inheritance in the saints of light. And God has made you qualified, worthy of receiving it. Gratitude is at the heart of godliness. Gratitude is at the heart of the Christian life and it's gonna come up several times in this book, 
because gratitude never loses sight of what God has done in Christ. Gratitude keeps the work of God in Jesus Christ front and center before our eyes continually. Even when we're in the hardest situations, even when we're in circumstances that would be deemed by outward circumstances as hopeless and difficult, we know in Christ we're headed for glory, a glory that we're wholly undeserving of. There's always reason to give thanks. Even when you're imprisoned, there's always reason to give thanks. And you see even here how Paul the Apostle is modeling all of these things for them. What is the first thing he did in verse 3? He thanked God. He was always grateful for what God has done. Now, as we're going to find, and we've already seen, this is a church with real problems, with real issues that he's going to have to confront, and yet still, he's so grateful. There's so much fruit around them. He's not just praying for them. He's modeling for them life in Christ. The prayer that I'm praying for you, this is how I want you to live, in joyful gratitude for what God's done in Christ. And that's why Paul concludes his prayer as he does in verses 13 and 14. After praying for the Colossians to increase in deeds, to increase in diligence, to seek out devotion to God, to live in joyful gratitude and doxology before him, Paul ends with the motivation of it all, God's grace in Christ. And he uses that image, he picks up from verse 12, the saints in light. That is where God is, God who is light, to be in his presence. And he uses that to contrast this world, this world that rebels against God, this world that struggles with meaninglessness, this world that struggles with hopelessness and futility, what kind of image would you use to describe a world of ignorant rebellion against its creator? How about verse 13, darkness? The image the Bible consistently uses for the world in sin against God. It's just dark. But it's not a morally neutral darkness either, is it? It's a domain of darkness. There's an authority, a tyranny of darkness, an evil rebellion against God in our sin rebelling against him. You might even describe this domain of darkness as the tyranny of our own independence, the tyranny of our own rebellion against God, our foolish rebellion against our very good God. We were created first to be fruitful and multiply in God's world, but we rejected him in sin, and we've lived under this tyranny ever since. So God sent his beloved son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die and rise again, to rescue all who trust him and who all belong to him. And he, verse 13, delivers us from the prison of our own independence, this present darkness, and transfers us into his own kingdom, the kingdom of his beloved son. Now look at who's bearing fruit. Christ is bearing fruit, verse six. It's growing in the whole world. Verse 10, it bears fruit in his people as he multiplies the work of his grace in their lives. The last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, is victorious. And he has completed where the first Adam failed and fulfilled his father's commission. And Christian, what Paul is describing here in verses 13 and 14 is where you and I live. We don't live under a dark domain anymore. We live in a world that is still marked by the dark domain, but we don't live in that. We live in the kingdom of his beloved son. We live under the authority of light. We live under the authority of Christ. The Christ in whom we have, verse 14, redemption. That word that comes out of the slave market in the first century, who has purchased us out from our bondage to that dark domain and has made us citizens of his own kingdom who has forgiven our sins to bring us before him so that now we can live with God. And that's the last note that Paul wants to strike for the Colossians that really summarizes the whole. Where you live, Christian, you live with God. Your life goal is God, is gratitude for God and his grace. It's growing to be pleasing God and knowing God 
by the work of Christ redeeming you from the bondage of sin, bringing you out from ignorant rebellion and darkness, and to bring you into his beloved light, now you can live with God. You can give thanks to him always. You can have patience in every trial and endure. You can seek to know and obey and live pleasing to him. You can simply just enjoy the God who brought you this hope regardless of what's going on in your life. You can always give thanks if you have faith and love and hope because God has been gracious to you. Our lives are far more about who we are in grace than where we do it or even what we do. And the things that tend to dominate our desires, that to focus our goals and our ambitions in life, are not the things that should drive our existence. It's God. It's knowing Him in Christ. It's God and His grace. And if you want one simple way to begin reorienting your life, just start with how you pray. Start with this prayer. Do you pray to enjoy God more? Do you pray just to give thanks to Him? Is this what you pray when you pray for others that you love? Just start with how we pray. What do you pray for when you pray? Pray for the grace of God. Make knowing Him and growing in His grace your goal in life. Let's pray. Father, we want this to be true of us. We want your grace to be not only the wellspring of our joy and our gratitude, we want it to be the dominating ambition of our lives. So Father, we pray that you would help us to live and to see even the apostles' prayers answered in our own lives. And we pray for each one of us that we would be so filled with knowing your will that we would live lives worthy of you, fully pleasing to you in every respect. Help us not, Father, to care about the things that the domain of darkness cares about. Help us to care about the priorities of your Son's kingdom, who you've transferred us into by your grace. And help us live lives of joyful gratitude and diligent obedience before you. We ask this, Father, depending only on your grace, knowing from beginning to end it is by your grace that we have come to you in your Son. We ask this for his glory, and we pray this for your glory and your work in your church. In Jesus' name, amen.